I first met Lance on New Year's Eve in London. I was 15, he was 17 at the time. I met him on social media and then um, spoke to him for about seven months until I actually met him on New Year's Eve. I went to London without my mum knowing. I come out the station, he was waiting there. His face just like lit off and so did mine. It was love at first sight. This story is about where we choose to house our most vulnerable children. But when Chloe first met Lance, who was in care, she didn't know anything about that. Fireworks obviously go off on New Year's Eve, so he was showing me the best place to go and watch them. I didn't even want to go home that next day. So we was together for like a year and a half. I used to meet him in London and just walk, literally walk around the South Bank so we could spend time together. We used to hold hands and chatting and just looking in shops really. Like he used to take me like Disney shop and get me teddies and flowers and all that palaver. Kids in care can move around a lot, from placement to placement, often with little notice. Chloe's teenage boyfriend was living in North London, put up by his local council in what's called supported or semi-supported accommodation. This kind of housing, often used for kids in care, has been springing up across the country. In our series, we've been investigating claims about this kind of accommodation, which is unregulated and unregistered. We've established that its use by councils to house children and young people in their care has increased by 70% in a decade. And in some cases, that's putting children in danger. Lance was one person behind those statistics and one of around 75,000 kids in care in the UK. In his case, his mum was unwell and for many years he was raised by his aunt, but he wanted more independence. And by the time Chloe met him, he was moving around the kind of housing we'd been investigating. From the start, I knew that he weren't in a good position. He was in about nine different homes, just changing literally anywhere. He would go from one side of London to the next and to the next, to the next, to the next. So it was horrible for him. Well, he seemed to think it was normal. I didn't agree it was normal. He was like very uncared for in the homes. Um, he, he didn't have no stability. It was like you all got left to yourself to do whatever you wanted to do. Um, there was no like moral rules of shopping, cleaning. I used to bring up fresh bed covers for him and clean up, just make it a bit homely for him where I was homely myself. These kind of supported homes could be on a street near you. Owners don't even have to register their existence, but they are one of the housing options for teenagers in the care of their local authority who've reached 16. Other kids are either fostered or in children's homes, both of which are regulated. The police have told Newsnight the 16-plus sector also needs regulation. Anybody can set one of these homes up. They're often not much more than a house on a residential street with support staff keeping an eye on the teenagers. Now the Children's Commissioner has joined those demanding the government tighten up the system. I agree with the police. This is a sector that needs to be regulated. I get calls with terrible examples of children who are saying they're being placed in accommodation without any kind of furniture apart from an old mattress. They're being um, taken there late at night. They have to share um, toilets with other residents that are over 18 and which can often be um, noisy and seemingly violent. And all of these are really unsuitable kind of environments for the most vulnerable children. When I wasn't with Lance, it used to be like, there used to be things going on behind the scenes that I didn't, not so much know about, but fights and people stealing from Lance, and taking his possessions down to even his clothing. He used to feel really upset about it. He self-harmed one time because of it. I don't think he actually realised how much deep trouble he was in until it was too late. Not long after Lance turned 18, Islington Children's Services moved him to West London, to a home run by a company called Urban Youth Flex, 
that housed children in care and care leavers. Islington's checks didn't raise any concerns about the home. But earlier that year, another London borough had taken a very different view about the suitability of this same accommodation. We've established that here in Brent, they decided not to place any children in that home because it didn't meet what the council told us were its quality assurance requirements. Startlingly, there is no system for local authorities to share this kind of information with each other, so Lance's borough, Islington, didn't know about Brent's decision. It wasn't passed on. Lance's new home was a four-bed house in this street. His room was all right, he said it was fine. He kept it quite clean and tidy and he cleaned up regularly, but there was little things that were a bit iffy in the home, like people would punch holes in the walls and when I went there, there were still holes in the walls, um, which the placement never covered up before he come. So he just like, he was like, don't worry about that, I'll stick my Arsenal shirts over it. So the whole wall was covered in Arsenal shirts. He'd been telling me that people had been fighting in the home, smashing windows. I felt like I didn't really want to go up there. It was unsafe, it was really dangerous compared to the other homes. Across London, in Ealing, another young man in the care system, 18-year-old Idris Hassan, urgently needed somewhere to move to. Ealing Council told us, with placements in short supply, the only accommodation available to it was the urban youth flex house where Lance already lived with a 16-year-old child in care from another borough. Neither the home nor the placing authority, Ealing, told Lance's council about Idris's arrival. There's no legal requirement for either to do so. He called me up and he said, oh, I've had having these problems with this other person. Idris Hassan was on bail following a violent episode. He had serious mental health problems and had recently spent six months detained in a medium secure psychiatric unit. Some of those treating him didn't think he should be discharged. Thursday or Friday, um, he got arguing with Idris over something, they got fighting. I believe Lance got the better of interest, not in a bad way, it was just like two people fighting. He said, well, the staff have called the police and an ambulance. Ealing Council told Newsnight Urban Youth Flex concealed the fact that this had happened. The home didn't inform either of the boys' councils about the fight, though it should have done. All weekend he was normal, like, there was nothing going on, so he was just talking to me, like, normally. He said after the fight that, like, Indris was talking to himself, um, like, talking to the walls in the bedroom. He could hear him shouting. So Lance was like, I think this guy's just a bit bonkers, to be honest with you. Like, he's talking to the walls and whatever. And then on the Monday, he told me he was in the office doing his CV. He was chatting to me all morning. He said he's got to wait for the staff to help him. And then from about 10 to 3, I didn't hear nothing from Lance, like, ever again. Indra's come in with a white bag or something over his hand. He had the knife in his hand and he stabbed Lance in the office. Um, Lance probably panicked. Um, and he ran, like, for his life out the window. Indra's, he just wasn't giving in. One wasn't enough for him. He wanted to kill Lance. So he carried on chasing him and caught up with Lance, where Lance is losing blood, and I can't, Lance is basically probably thinking, I'm going to die now, and that's when he caught up with him and he stabbed him multiple times. I think it was about eight to 11 times Lance got stabbed in the back. It was really hard for me to get through everything and to get on with my own life, to think about him all the time. It really did bring me down. I used to miss it. I used to say every day for about three months, I miss him, I miss him, I miss him. Idris later pleaded guilty to manslaughter with diminished responsibility and was sent to a secure hospital. The judge's sentencing remarks make shocking reading. Lance's killer had a troubling history of carrying knives and mental health problems. The judge said, this defendant has been before the courts before a number of times, for wounding with intent in 2013, for battery in 2015. 
He pleaded guilty to having a knife or a sharp pointed instrument in a public place in 2012 and 2014 and of having an offensive weapon in a public place in 2013. From around that time, Idris had also developed a severe mental illness and from 2014 was experiencing psychotic episodes. He hadn't been taking his prescribed medication in the run-up to Lance's death. I'm not going to say it isn't his fault because it is. Social services, they should have been more quick with people like that because it's just putting people in danger. He was meant to have an assessment which they didn't pick up on and by the looks of Idris's background, he shouldn't have been nowhere near anyone. After the killing, Idris's counsel, Ealing, carried out an investigation. This case review concluded Lance's death couldn't have been prevented. The Children's Commissioner, for one, disagrees. It could have been prevented if Lance had had the help and support and security he needed. It can't be that councils, government, departments continue to see these issues as one-offs. Actually, I spend most of my time joining the dots and showing what the consequences are. And everyone who has responsibilities about children needs to start doing the same. The NHS has recently begun an independent investigation into the circumstances that led to Lance's killing. Not everybody in the sector believes regulation is needed, but both Lance's counsel and Idris's told Newsnight the government must change the law. Last night, the children's minister told Newsnight he is looking at licensing and registration to eliminate what he termed the rogue elements within some of these homes. For many, that doesn't go far enough. From my experience, if I was someone younger to be put in that accommodation, I would feel absolutely petrified. I don't see them making any effort to help these people in care. They don't see the risk that these children are in, and they're in great danger. Urban youth flags, the now defunct provider behind the home where Lance and Idris lived, didn't respond to Newsnight's several requests to comment. Islington Council said after Lance's death it commissioned a thorough independent investigation of its role in the case. Since this terrible tragedy, we have put additional safeguards in place above and above beyond those regarded by legislation and best practice guidance. Ealing Council said in placing Idris in the home, it acted with all appropriate diligence in assessing the suitability of the accommodation. The subsequent review highlighted additional information that may have affected the decision to place had it been available at the time.